Uh, so yeah, uh, welcome everyone. And today we'll talk about how to improve a long home based on SBDK. So I'm David Ko uh, uh, from SUSE. I'm Keith Lucas from Oracle Labs. Yep, so we just get stuck. Yeah, probably someone uh, in this room probably did not use long home before. So we have a one part. We'll talk about what is a long home and what a long home current work, works and how the, what the challenge long home has right now. And next, we will talk about based on the challenge we are facing right now, how we leverage SBDK in the future and how it really works and uh, what benefit it will be taken from SBDK. And lastly, we will talk about the uh, uh, benchmark we have uh, right now to share with everyone, and also some uh, areas we want to improve in the future. Okay, so uh, Long, Home, uh, Long Home is a CNCF project, incubating uh, project right now, and he's uh, focused on the persistent volume stuff. So it's highly available and software defined uh, persistent bus storage based on Kubernetes and also run for Kubernetes. So all the things we just leverage on the Kubernetes stuff. So he's quite lightweight, reliable, and easy to use. What I say that, because we're based on the user experience and we don't have any external dependency, actually. So take example, we don't have any external database or stuff. We just leverage the Kubernetes resource, like API resource. So this is what we have. So deploy long home is quite simple. And also, we support the, all the persistent volume and with the different type of uh, volume modes, SS modes, uh, rewrite many, rewrite only, as uh, multi modes, multi bar device, or file system. And of course, if you use a long home, you will question about rewrite many is when you will get to uh, general variable. So you can check that tomorrow we have another session, a maintenance track, talk about long home roadmap. And also, it's a storage agnostic. So that means he will be easy to deploy based on the host, the host uh, file system. Any file system support the sparse file because uh, Long Home uh, used the sparse file for his uh, simple vision capability. So uh, here we mentioned the ESD4 and XFS is actually verified by uh, Long Home team. So you can use that directly. And also, not just in cluster, we have an in cluster snapshot, but also support the external uh, backup and restore. So, uh, different type of uh, backup target we support right now is NFS and S3 compatible API uh, the backup target. And as I say, it's a Kubernetes, uh, we use the Kubernetes resource. So, Kubernetes uh, design patterns is what we adopt, uh, basically, control patterns and uh, customer resource design. Uh, sorry. Yeah, definition is what we use right now, and also it's open source. And how long home works right now is simply said that we have uh, five parts I want to I want to uh, brief introduce a little bit, and it's about the volume and the volume life cycle and data placement uh, deployment and control plan. And volume you can is composed of uh, three parts: volume from end. Volume itself, we call it engine, uh, if you use the long home terminology. And also, the data placement is for the volume replicates. And about life, uh, volume life cycle, we 100% rely on CSI protocol. So it will be driven by the Kubernetes building customer resource, PVC here. So any following operation just for the CSI uh, protocol. And data placement uh, is uh, uh, all the data located in the long home disk. And long home disk is actually the, uh, the, the, the file the, uh, on top of uh, host file system, as I mentioned. So you can create different long home disk per node. And even you can create a mount point for different partition, but regard as uh, like a long home disk. And deployment uh, for volume, you can see the right hand side, the diagram. The volume is composed with the uh, engine and replicas, and each one is like a segregate uh, component. So you will be independent from each other. E e uh, one volume have some problem will not impact others. This is what we design right now. So you will make your uh, volume is much safe, will not impact by others. 
and control plan. Uh, long have a control plan and data plan and control plan based on Kubernetes. Very straightforward. Okay, if you would dive into a little bit about Longhorn Engine and Replica database, because today we will talk about database. In the current model, we use a volume from and based on iSCSI protocol. So he will let the Longhorn volume by one by the open iSCSI. Uh, is that we use a, as a client to make it happen on the host side. And also, volume engine is uh, like uh, the, the volume controller. So he will be have an engine process along with the TGT target server to make sure the data can pass through the TGT server then down to the engine. An engine have a two major parts. It's a, one is a TCP-based TCP data server, and the other one is the old uh, volume controller. He's a gRPC server to accept the different comments from the upstream. And the last part is replica. Replica is for the data, volume data. So the engine will bypass the uh, commands or even data I.O. to a downstream replica to save uh, to the local replica or e re even remote replicas. And all the operation will just happen at the replica level. So like a snapshot, uh, rebuilding, coils, merge, prune, uh, purge, et cetera. So this is a diagram to talk about what I say uh, about the database. So you can simply say you have a workload, the user application, uh, and you start to do have uh, some I/O stuff, and go into the your volume, long home volume. On top of that, have a file system, and then you will go into the iSCSI bot device is posed by the long home, and you will go to the iSCSI D is the uh, host. Uh, uh, client library to make sure you can write to the long home volume and you will be uh, running on the TGT and use the lib long home library communicate with the each engine. Engine is what I say is a volume controller. Then make sure the uh, uh, I.O. it will downstream to a uh, down pass to a long home replica. But this is cur currently what long home works. How are the challenge right now long home has? The first one, uh, is too many components. I mean, too many components along the database. It's like you see, the user need to prepare, set up iSCSD, and Lohan will create a TGT and engine process for each volume. So he will be uh, a little complicated from the database point of view. And the second one, because uh, too many components, so we will cause the different uh, cost, uh, extra cost for the communication, especially for the database you need to I.O. through the different parts, like here, TGT and engine. And that's one I want to emphasize is I.O. models limitation, because right now we based on the sparse file and with the direct I.O. and with the blocking read and write so far. So you will have uh, some challenges for the performance perspective and also, uh, if we want to leverage like uh, a synchronized I/O stuff, you will be a little challenging right now for the current architecture. And also, for sure, different language or different integration, especially, uh, especially you want to integrate system stuff, have a different effort for for uh, for sure. Yeah. So this is a primary challenge so far for uh, Long Hong has right now. So we start think about how to move forward to create a next generation data plan for long haul. So what's the SBDK keys? We'll talk about that. Uh, SBDK is a, is the software performance development kit. It's used in a lot of high performance cloud applications. And one of the things that it's kind of based off of is the data plane um, development kit, which is a, a tool that is used by other cloud service providers to um, uh, utilize network device drivers in user space to provide better performance than using the kernel. And this kind of includes uh, um, DPDK in its source code and uses some of the methodology behind that to kind of provide better performance for any kind of application. And one of the things that it also has is a generic block device application layer with several different implementations and a relatively easy way of implementing it. And 
we kind of got to a dead end with the current um, implementation of Longhorn where we have multiple Go routines, each using blocking I.O., and it kind of didn't provide any means to easily support the asynchronous methodology to improve performance, but um, SPDK already has some, some of these generic block devices that use frameworks like libAIO or IOU ring to provide better performance and allow us to basically plug and play and try those out and test those more quickly than rewriting the long run engine the way it is. And as we were discussing earlier, we were um, mentioning that Longhorn currently uses iSCSI by using TGT, which is an open source software product that we modified to interface with the Longhorn engine. Um, SPDK supports that as well as a newer type, kind of as, a, as in we no longer just use SATA drives, we use NVMe drives. So, in, so NVMe over fabrics is like an improved network protocol for um, uh, network av available volumes. And it has a feature called volu logical volumes, which we allows us to f store data in a way that's equivalent to how Longhorn currently works with its sparse file methodology of storing data. Um, so we can have an equivalent, a feature equivalence between the two. And also, basically, it's designed for asynchronous programming, which for the most part seems to perform better, especially for uh, intense I.O. performances. I mean, Longhorn currently provides um, relatively good performance, but we want to make it better. And I think one thing that we do at each level of that data path is we allocate memory, then deallocate it. In um, TGT, we kind of malloc it, then free it. And in the Go portion of that, we allocate it, then you let the garbage collector um, at some random time uh, free that memory. So this kind of has a model to kind of consolidate our memory usage and make it more efficient. So I was kind of talking about the uh, logical volumes and how it's equivalent to the sparse provisioning that Longhorn uses. So Longhorn uses sparse files, and we have a kind of a hierarchy of sparse files to find the data that we want in a particular volume, and we guess, guess we have a separate directory for that. And this logical volume feature in SPDK kind of performs the same thing, but it doesn't use the file system functionality for the sparse files. We, um, it kind of just stores it in a huge, so it can, be the kind of the equivalent of a file system and store all of its data within a, a huge disk and manage it as if it was a file system, but it's able to do it more efficiently because it doesn't have to support all the features of the file system. And basically SPK, SPDK is the only user of it, so it doesn't have to deal with any of the contention that a normal file system would have to deal with. So I took the picture of how Longhorn sparse provisioning works from our Longhorn website, and I took a picture of SPDK's logical volumes from SPDK's website, and I think both of these show the methodology that both systems use for kind of determining like how to read a, read or write a block. So when we have like a hierarchy of um, snapshots or um, data, and all that data can be sparse, so for, in both cases, if I like wanted to, for example, read block two, I have to look up to see if that data is available in that particular, in the top level. So if I looked up two, I'd have to use an IOCTL or IOCTL to see what's available at that particular block and, then, and see if that is sparse or not. And if it's a sparse or it's an empty location in the file, I go to the, to the next um, snapshot 
and so forth. And in this diagram, two, I have to go through um, three layers before I actually find the data in the oldest snapshot. And similarly, this um, SPDK has the same functionality, except it implements that the ability to query the sparse data like internally so we don't have to use the kernel to get that sparse information. So we go, um, we can just uh, traverse that hierarchy, then find our data um, uh, without some of the stuff. And basically, and all of these um, snapshots in SBDK are within the block device that we don't have a file system on, whereas with um, Longhorn, each of these snapshots is a separate file within a file system that we're traversing. So one of the things that SBDK kind of makes it easy to do, use is to program asynchronously. And for the most part, this kind of allows you to achieve better performance and with this methodology, basically, IO functions don't block. If you perform a read or a write, it doesn't block, but it's like you register an event, then we have a main loop that checks to see um, the status of that and continuously checks to see if, this, if it's complete. Then we are notified via a callback if it's complete. And this is basically the model that's used by um, lib AIO or IO U-ring, which is the um, kind of the, async the more modern asynchronous ways that of performing IO that are more performant and or something that we kind of want to emulate and try out and SPDK allows you to kind of easily do this. So, um, so we're going to redesign the, the data plane part of Longhorn to work with SBDK. And for the first point, we're going to um, switch to using NVMe over Fabrics for Longhorn's block device instead of iSCSI. Um, Linux has mature support for NVMe over Fabrics. The Linux kernel has kind of a better interface for NVMe over Fabrics than iSCSI. Um, we, for example, iSCSI has a daemon process, iSCSI D, that's running and kind of handles some of the TCP connection portions of um, the protocol, whereas the kernel directly supports it and it has like a system FS um, or sysFS support. And so there's like no process running the kernel directly communicates the NVMe over Fabrics protocol. Then we're going to implement the re-implement the long run engine as a custom block device within SBDK. And this will be equivalent to the long run engine that we kind of showed earlier. And so each volume in, within this Longhorn volume will have a set of replicas and we'll have them be either local and have it within the SPDK process or remote and that would be um, in like on other nodes in the Kubernetes, no, Kubernetes uh, cluster. And so it's kind of equivalent to that except um, well, you, to communicate with the red, with the remote nodes, we'll use NVMe over Fabrics again. And right now, we kind of use our own custom protocol for communicating with our replicas. And this is, we'll be using a protocol that we know is relatively efficient and probably better than the one that we designed, designed ourselves. So each write operation, this is a bit equivalent to how Longhorn works currently, is we distribute all of our write operations to all the replicas and verify that they're complete before returning a uh, write complete to the application. Then we also, since we have multiple replicas, we only need to use one for a read operation. And we currently will be doing that in a round robin. We'll just go from one to the next one for each read operation and kind of distribute them throughout all the nodes. And we'll also support snapshots and rebuilding 
new, new volumes when added. I, um, so snapshots is that kind of functionality that's built into Longhorn to, um, you know, have an atomic point where we um, store the state of the volume. And rebuilding is what happens when you add a new replica when the volume is already up, so you need to copy that data that exists to a, the new node that you're adding. And one of the departures that we're using, doing with Longhorn with SPDK is that we're going to have only one SPDK process per Kubernetes node. Each um, SPDK process will handle multiple block devices um, prior or with the current Longhorn there's one long run engine per process. And like TGTD is the thing that handles all the volumes. So we're going to be generally um, reducing the number of processes and SBDK is handling more of the scheduling than using blocking IO that to run the, to allow the, uh, never mind. Okay, so I have a diagram of kind of what I just explained, and this is a, an example of a, a volume with three replicas um, using SPDK, and I guess we have the kind of the same thing as we had before where we have the user application interfacing with a file system driver in the kernel, and that kernel um, file system driver is using the block device, which in this case will be an NVMe over Fabrics block device, and the kernel will be directly in communicating with our SBDK process, which is called SBTK TGT, and we have our special Longhorn block device or BDEV, and this one has one the local replica and two remote replicas, and within each of those replicas, we have a logical volume store for our particular volume. So now we're going to discuss some of the preliminary performance results that we got from this new implementation of Longhorn. Um, first off, we, I guess this is the environment that we used. It was basically a bare metal server from a cloud service provider. Um, and I used one of the S SSDs, and those SSDs were SATA, um, so, um, but, okay. So our test methodology was, is that we use the KBench utility, which is a program that Longhorn developed to test um, the performance of various volumes, and um, we test, um, IO operations per second, bandwidth and latency, by using the FIO command, which is kind of a, a t utility that was used to benchmark the Linux kernel's block device implementation. And it was um, also developed by the author of the block device implementation in the kernel, um, Jens Axbo, and also um, he's the author of the, the newest IO methodology in Linux, IO U-Ring. And we had two tests that we, we did. First test is we um, tested a raw disk, the existing Longhorn and Longhorn with SBK on a single node. I think the main motivation was this, to see the overall impact of using either implementation of Longhorn versus just using the disk. In the second example, we did a three node scenario with both the existing Longhorn and SBDK. So here are our results. And um, so I think the one thing that was very interesting is I th it seems as if the Longhorn um, with SBDK performs very similarly to the, just using the raw disk. Uh, in terms of both the bandwidth and the, um, I think it's most equivalent in bandwidth and the IO operations per second, it's 
relatively close, but I guess it's a little bit down on that. And the latency is very similar. I think it seems to be it's about uh, 20 to 25 microseconds of latency and over just using the disk. So it's like we're, we're achieving a relatively good performance. And it's, in all cases, it seems to be better than the existing Longhorn. The latency is much improved. The bandwidth for um, writes is um, Im improved to compared to the current Longhorn. And also the, I mean, the bandwidth is kind of equivalent and the IO ops per second are very much improved. So I guess um, that's kind of a summary of what I just said. Um, the bandwidth improves in all categories. It's very similar to just using the disk. And the overall latency is about like 25 to 30 microseconds versus 100 microseconds with Longhorn. So this is the three node that, um, performance comparison. Um, there was no disk equivalent because that's not really possible. So, um, and in this case, it's also very much improved for, compared to the current Longhorn. Um, we have better, um, much better IO um, operations per second, especially compared to write. And the bandwidth is also improved. Um, I mean, if you like think about it, the existing Longhorn is already doing over a, a a gigabyte of data per second, but we're have, doing even better with SPDK. Um, the latency is also improved, and in general, it's performing better. And you can kind of see, compared to the single node scenario, our three node scenario like performs better than the like it. It's a kind of equivalent to RAID 1, and it, in this network scenario, it performs better with read operations than just a single disk on a single node. And, and I think, like, we haven't even scratched the surface of all the things that you could do with SPDK. Um, I think one of the things that SPDK is noted for, noted for is doing user space NVMe support, so if one of the nodes in our Kubernetes cluster actually used NVMe drives, we might be able to access them directly instead of using the Linux kernels driver. And this is like one of the SPDKs claim the frame, it's kind of equivalent to how uh, DPDK uses network drivers in user space. Um, we didn't initially do this because we wanted to have a wide uh, scope of scenarios that we could support, so we could support any sort of environment, not necessarily only uh, NVMe environment. But I think we could, um, as uh, everyone moves to using actual NVMe drives instead of other formats, we can potentially go and investigate doing that. Um, we can also try to use uh, um, IOU ring and other new technologies. When I tried to use IOU ring it, in SPDK, at one point in time, it didn't work. But I'm, since Longhorn isn't the only person working working on this, we could um, also test out as changes come upstream to the SPDK project. And another thing that is also very dependent on the cluster environment is using a feature called our DMA, which is basically like DMA, which is direct memory access, which is kind of a way to transport data without using the CPU. And there's a possibility of extending what we did to have NVMe fabrics use our DMA using special drivers in the Linux kernel to more efficiently transport data over the network instead of using the TCP approach, which is um, what we're currently using, and our DMA could improve performance even more. So I guess what's next for Longhorn? So we kind of developed 
Longhorn SPDK in isolation outside of the rest of Longhorn, which is the one that enables it to work with Kubernetes. So um, we need to do a lot of changes into how it's deployed. Um, the, I guess the main thing that the handles how things work within Longhorn, how it deploys all the um, uh, pods or controls most how it's deployed on a Kubernetes network is a, something called the Longhorn Engine. I mean, the Longhorn Manager. And we kind of need to change how it deploys Longhorn on a Kubernetes network because we're moving from one Longhorn per engine process per node to, I mean, multiple Longhorn engine processes per node to one SPTA process per node that handles all of the um, volumes. So we're going to, we have this component called the instant manager that manages all these processes and we need to um, kind of refactor that and make it uh, I basically remove it and just have one SPDK process. And I think as David was mentioning, we have a lot of um, CRDs and these CRDs kind of reflect the current process model. We kind of need to update that to reflect the new process model going forward. And we're gonna basically remove this iSCSI component and TGDT and transition to NVMe over fabrics. Um, it, and another thing that we need to do is the long run manager, manager communicates to each of these engine processes over gRPC and SPDK doesn't talk gRPC. So we need to develop a new mechanism for community, community, communicating to these long run engine processes in order to move forward to have it integrated with the whole of Longhorn. And we need to kind of implement some of the things that Longhorn has currently like backup and restore, kind of achieve full feature parity with the existing Longhorn and, and before we can move forward. And we're currently working on this and we're working on a technology preview that will kind of show Longhorn um, more integrated with SPDK. And it's a kind of a significant change and, um, but we're working on it and do you have it? Is there any questions? What, what's that? Yeah, what Longhorn release is that going to be featured in? Okay, yeah. So we, uh, right now we just show the volume parts. So what we are working right now is the control plane feature parity integration. So I would say the better timing is next year. Uh, Long have a quite periodical cadency for release. So each year we have a two feature release. So I would say in the, the coming release is 1.4.0 is end of this year. But this, feature, uh, this release will not have SPDK preview stuff. But it will happen, I expect it will happen in 1.5, we have a preview version, but maybe not including all the feature parity, but the end goal is next year. So this is about the SPD integration. Thank you, David and Keith. Anyone? So the new volumes created using SPDK would, uh, sorry, the old volumes would need to be converted to SPDK? You mean the compatible? The, um, the current they're, volumes. They're, so they're not compatible right now, but I think we have the ability to convert them between the old format and the new format. And if, I think we have the initial effort of that, but we might have, um, we might develop a means to actually automatically do that as when they deploy the new version. So I would say probably not this, not not non destructive, destructive. But uh, we are trying to because upstream SPDK have a lot of application integration already. Take example like SPDK DD. So we try to think about how to integrate to make sure the sparse file can be 
can be migrated to the SBDK bar file, so it would be better to do the migration. But I would not say, you still need to investigate to see how it works. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone.